I'd like to welcome you here, those of you who are here virtually with us, we welcome you. We welcome you to this new way of worship as we embrace changing times. We have several announcements still, a reminder that the Easter flowers are still taking orders for them up until April 5th. You can mail them in or you can swing by the church and drop it in through the mail slot that we have here. We also have to remind you that the One Great Hour of Sharing offering will be postponed to a later date. The Lenten soup suppers have been canceled and we will talk about a Bible study that we can make up later. And last uh, is the donations for the Huffman family. For those of you who still aren't familiar with this, member Court and his wife Amy, their son, and grandson of Bob and Diane Huffman, Benjamin, was diagnosed with cancer and is still battling that, and we are collecting money to support that family in their time of need. One final thing is a note. Those of you who are with us remotely have the bulletin available. In front of them, you will see that the scripture reading for the New Testament is incorrect. The scripture reading will actually be John 11, 1 through 45. Sometimes when you're making these bulletins so far in advance and in preparation for other things, uh, mistakes do happen. Let us just take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship and listen to words of scripture about Christ's peace. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. If you are at home, I would invite you to join with me in the call to worship. The prophet asks, can our soul-weary bones live again? Oh God, you know. We ask, can you dance again after mourning loss and grief? Oh God, you know. The gift is sure and unmistakable. God's breath is poured out as a new life for weary souls. Let us celebrate the gift of God's new life and come to worship God in laughter and in dancing and in all of these new ways. I would invite you to also join with me in reading the prayer of the day. Compassionate God, the wind of your spirit is the very sign of life for all who long for you. One breath from you, and we are rescued from the arid valley of dry bones, given muscles and sinews and joy with which to praise you. We are filled with the holy hope you grant to all your faithful children. Let our lives be filled with the life breath of the Spirit, that what was lain dormant may burst into bloom, and what looks to us to be death may be revealed as but sleep for the emergence of new life. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive only ourselves, and God's truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and just, will hear our prayers and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, let us join together to confess our prayer to God. O oh Lord, if you held our sin against us, who could live? Who could stand? We seem to have more faith in death than hope in your promise of life. We seek peace through war. We abandon the hungry, sick, and dying. We forget to live in the promise of eternal life in the here and now. Help us to see the errors of our ways. Help us to give up our understanding of your knowledge and wisdom of life. Amen.
Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for each one of us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. That old life is gone. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. At this time, let us hear the word of the Lord. O oh Lord, we wait for you. In your word, we trust. By the power of your spirit, set our hearts and mind on the source and life of peace. Amen. Good morning, all. The Old Testament this morning, Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. <clears throat> and the New Testament comes from John 11, verses 1 to 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory 
so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, through Je excuse, accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to, to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their, bro her, their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. While Mary stayed home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Jesus weeps. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up and quickly go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. 
Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with stripes of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let us pray. Lord God, empty me of me and fill me with you so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me. And Lord, open the ears of the hearers that are among us today, whether here in spirit or body, let them hear what it is you are calling on their hearts to take from your word into their lives and into the world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Now, over the past few weeks of Lent, we have been discussing the things we are called to give up. We first discussed giving up control, in which the story of Jesus' temptation revealed that we are to give up control by replacing it with self-control. Following giving up control, we discussed giving up societal preconceptions. In the story of Nicodemus, we saw that in order to embrace the ideals of the kingdom of God, we must first give up these preconceptions. And last we heard about God's call for us to give up superiority. In the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, we see Jesus is reminding us to give up our judgments and unconscious superior thinking that causes people to feel like nobodies. All of these things that we are called to give up culminate in what this final week's call to give up is. In the stories from Ezekiel with the dry bones as well as Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, we will see the call to give it all up. The call to give up our former lives for a new life in Christ. In the story from John's Gospel, we witness Jesus' last miracle, the miracle that will eventually lead to his death because many of those who witnessed it will run and tell the Pharisees fueling their desire to squash his rapidly spreading gospel message. The message that Jesus sums up in his interaction. Jesus begins to reveal this message of hope in his response to Martha's misunderstanding of it. You see, Martha responds to Jesus' statement that her brother will rise again by acknowledging her belief in the final resurrection on the last day. Jesus' response is where we witness the greatest point in this story. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. 
Jesus is not only talking here about life after death, he is talking here about the life in the here and the now. Jesus is not just the resurrection, Jesus is the life. To live in Jesus is to give up the lives of our former understanding, to give up that control for self-control, to give up the societal preconceptions to live into God's call, to give up our superior judges, judgments for more of a transcendental understanding that all are made in the image of God. Now, although this is the culmination of Jesus' message here, I believe that belief in him means embracing this new life, these new ways of seeing and giving up the old ways. His message is further reiterated in the actual raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus' actions, Jesus' miracle is what brings about this new life. Lazarus' mortal life was restored, but so was his spiritual life. Lazarus' resurrection reminds us of our call to die to the things of the flesh, as Paul points out in the passage from Romans, and to be resurrected to new life in Christ. What is it in our lives that we must give up in order to fully embrace this new life in Christ? What fears, anxieties, control, preconceptions, societal judgments, superior thinking must we give up in order to answer this call to leave behind the former things for this new life in Christ. In this passage, Jesus also reveals that this new life in Christ is one that is eternal. Jesus says, everyone who believes in me will never die. This is not saying that their mortal, physical bodies won't die because we know that if you live on earth, you will inevitably die here. In this new life, Jesus is saying we have eternal life. We are used to thinking, thinking in life in terms of fixed beginnings and endings, but the story of Jesus calls us to throw away all of those old categories and embrace God's larger vision of eternal life that begins here and now. A new life in Christ that embraces God's ways and leaves behind the former ones. A life that works for the kingdom of God today. A life that is lived with hope of the eternity with God. A new life that is a response to the grace and mercy given to us through Christ's death and resurrection. Now even if we embrace this new life and we die to the old, we may still find ourselves falling prey to life's former ways. In Ezekiel, we witness a vision in which the valley of the dry bones come to life again. In a sense, the spirits reanimating dead bodies remind us that what is dead can be made new. What Ezekiel's vision is portraying is that the Spirit of God can reanimate, reanimate the exilic people who have lost their way and find themselves in despair, believing that there is no way out. So often we are like these exilic people who have lost our way and despair that we cannot come back from this death to life. Ezekiel's vision reminds us that God reanimates those who have lost their way. Through Ezekiel, God reminds us not to despair and not to give in to those fleshly human issues, but to trust that God can bring new life again. God's spirit can reanimate us here and now to recall all the things that we need to give up, the fleshly fears of anxiety and control, and act in ways that are in line with God's ways. As we see in both Ezekiel and John, God creates life from seemingly nothingness, hopelessness, and even death. The Bible is full of these paradoxes, as Jesus tells us earlier that those who try to keep their lives will die, 
but those who give up their lives for others will live. Right now, it seems like there's a lot of hopelessness and despair, but we must remember that God can create new life in us, and he can create life from hopelessness, nothingness, and even death. When God does create new life in us, we are called to give up that former lives, to give up that fleshly thinking, to embrace this new eternal life which begins here and now. Like Jesus called Lazarus to new life, he is calling us to new life in him. So how will we answer? Now, I believe that God in nature has given us a beautiful example of what it means to give up one's life for new life in Christ. That is, example is found in the metamorphosis of a caterpillar. The caterpillar begins its life in one form, but it knows it's called to a new life. It goes along eating and doing its daily activities until one day it knows it's time to begin this new life. And so the caterpillar forms a chrysalis and remains there for days, even weeks, until one day it emerges this new, beautiful self. Isn't it interesting that butterflies are also the symbol of those who have passed on from this life into the next? The process of metamorphosis in the life of a butterfly is a great reminder of what it means that we are called to shed the former ways of life, the flesh, for this new life in Christ. We must first go through a period of death in order to be resurrected into this new life in Christ. Throughout Lent, we have learned all that we need to give up in order to leave the life of a caterpillar behind and embrace our new life in Christ as a butterfly. Sure, as Ezekiel reminds us, there will be times where we will revert back to our former ways, but God's grace covers those mistakes and Jesus calls us back to life. What is Jesus saying that you need to give up, especially in these times of fleshly anxiety, fear, judgments, and more? in order to embrace the kingdom of God in the here and now. What in your life must you give up in order to live in response to God's grace by participating in God's kingdom here and now through your actions that are in line with God's ways? Let us remember that God calls us to give up our lives, the ways of the flesh, the ways of superior thinking, the ways of societal preconceptions, the desire to control, and all of this to give up for a new life in Christ that displays the kingdom of God. Let us embrace this new life in Christ for the sake of the gospel and the sake of the world. I would invite all of us to join in prayer for the many people in our world today. Let us pray. Lord God, we know you answer prayers. And we know that you have called us to bring all of our concerns up to you. So today, Lord, we lift up any of those people and all of us who are in home or who are out there still working. Lord, we lift everyone up for protection and healing, for whatever it is to re that they need to relieve their anxieties, that they may see your Christ, peace that is shared through others. Lord, today we especially lift up many among us, our friends and family. We lift up Walt, Carol, Barbara, Linda, Jerry, Bobby, Kathy, Sue, Alan, Mary, Nancy, Brenda and Ron, Maureen, Jan, 
all those healthcare workers as well as those on the front lines of this. Joe Ellen, Sandy, Kathy, Joe, Sydney, Bill, the Gormley family, Ron, Don, George, Benjamin, the Baron family, David, and the family of Miharu. We also lift up any of those who we name on our hearts. Lord, let everyone, everyone, feel your peace in these trying times. We pray this to you using the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I'd like to leave you with one scripture. Which comes from John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace... I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Go now remembering that we are called to give up those lives of fear and anxiety and embrace this new life in Christ and share that peace of Christ with others. As we end today, may we remember that we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Go and share that peace with the world. Amen.